I'm going to allow, I'm going to let the next person um, introduce themselves <laughs> and their project. Francesco is a uh, grantee. He has a magic grant from the Brown Institute. Uh, this is a kind of a, this is an advert for my absent friend, Mark Hansen, um, <laughs> and my present friend, Anne Grimes, uh, for uh, magic grants, which are um, annual grants to uh, interdisciplinary teams, which have to have some connection uh, to either Stanford or Columbia, um, but that connection can be because you borrow one of our students to work on your project. Um, and they give away really quite significant amounts of money uh, for those interdisciplinary teams to work on um, creative solutions to either storytelling or media related or journalistic problems. And one of the things I was just thinking, listening to the incredible panelists that we had uh, before the break was how much we need people to do really cool work on the archive and how creative that is. And actually kind of, you know, journalists tend to be always looking for the next thing, the next thing, how can I tell the next story? But looking backwards, or at least kind of looking at the archive now, um, is such a sort of source of creativity. Um, and it's clear that we need the tools and the inspiration and the data to be able to do that in a creative way, which is why we've got Francesco <laughs> to, um, uh, to present his project, which is really phenomenal. And he has um, used data and archiving in a way to tell a very, very powerful story. So Francesco, I'll let you. Take it away Thanks. from that point. <coughs> Thanks, Emily. Can, can you all hear me? OK. Um, so one correction is I'm hopefully about to use data and archiving uh, in a powerful way, because uh, my, my grant was funded uh, uh, <coughs> in uh, the 2017-2018 the kind of funding period. And, and it takes place in Rwanda. And I haven't gone to Rwanda yet. I'm going actually in uh, nine days. Um, so that's when I get all my, all of my reporting done. But so th thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Possibly over caffeinated, um, but uh, <laughs> I'm representing. But I have to represent two other people. So maybe I need more energy. Uh, so my colleagues, Kathy, Kathy Vaughn and uh, Amir uh, Imani, uh, are also involved in this project, and it's a, a, a journalism project, a storytelling project, and it's called. Uh, data interrupted, and I'll tell you just more about that in one second. But I just wanted to put a plug for my day job. My day job is to oversee communications for this place called the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, and um, IRI. Just known as the mission there is to help um, uh, help developing countries predict and better manage the impact of climate-related risks: flooding, heat waves, cold waves, epidemics of um, vector-borne diseases, and um, and other such things. So reporters in the audience or reporters out there, if you have a story about climate or climate-related issues in development, I'm your guy. I'm also the guy that they let into the room with the PowerPoint. I'm sorry about that, but I, uh, <laughs> everything else was a panel. But there's always that one person that has the PowerPoint. Um, OK. So my presentation is uh, going to be about our project. And it's uh, about looking at the genocide that happened in Rwanda. Uh, through a data lens. So in uh, 1994, um, 24 years ago this week, started what would be over 100 days a genocidal mass slaughter, uh, where almost a million people uh, were killed um, in uh, just sort of incite incited ethnic-fueled um, conflict. And uh, another 2 million people in the country would, would flee just to avoid that, that same fate. And bear with me for a second. I'm going to try to do something. The, the, um, the violence exploded. It wasn't gradual. And, and it was everywhere at once. And this is just a, a sort of short animation, a heat map of the reported uh, Con, uh, deaths uh, due to the conflict in the country. I'm sorry you can't see the outline of the country, but I think it'll be pretty apparent. So this starts in February of 94 and goes to about November of 94. 
So um, <clears throat> as many of you who know about the, the genocide, it's, it's hard to sort of not know about it. Um, um, it, it very much was a product of uh, hatred that was uh, spewed on radio. And so one thing that we were looking at initially is to, to see whether the data that we, were, we had access to could somehow predict where the, as the violence was spreading. But, but really, the violence just sort of emerged um, simultaneously in many places. Um, so the, the, the civil war between the Hutu and Tutsis uh, uh, and the genocide that it spawned, I mean, it, it erased families, clans. Uh, it, it gutted public institutions, it destroyed infrastructure, and it left the society uh, in, in shambles. And to, today the story is, um, it's different. You know, the country, it's, it's survived in many ways, and for many measures, not all measures. It's thriving. It, um, it has had a strong, very steady uh, economic growth, and it's pushing to become a financial and services kind of powerhouse in, in the region. And so this is kind of a story that we know, like sort of the ashes of a nearly failed state that has just been written um, to um, um, a, a thriving society. Um, but <clears throat> there's uh, another consequence of the genocide that uh, I didn't know about, and I don't think many people have thought about, um, and that's really the basis of the project. And it's that the, the conflict brought about a near total collapse of Rwanda's ability to collect data about its people and its environment for nearly half a generation. And I'm particularly, because of the work that I do in my background, I'm particularly interested in um, the loss of the country's uh, me meteorological data, its weather data. And something I've been obsessed with for two years ever since seeing this graph. So this basically shows the number of weather stations in Rwanda over time. And, um, uh, Weather stations are things that measure daily rainfall, temperature, minimum and maximum temperature, uh, pressure, and other kinds of environmental variables. And, variables. and what they do is they record uh, the story of climate in a place over time. And so in Rwanda, uh, the, the, the events of the early 90s basically just crippled that ability and that record. And so there, there's just sort of a, the, the, the country, uh, from a data point of view, just went, went dark. And I think... I think um, the MET data, the weather data, can be used as a proxy for other kinds of data sets that I'm sure we're in similar, <coughs> facing similar issues uh, in the public, you know, all the public institutions of a country and what it collects from time to time. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know what a weather station looks like, it, it could be like this, it's kind of a fancier one. Um, a lot of them are even more like automated now, and so people don't have to come and read the different um, measurements that the in instruments are recording. But in many cases, it's like this. This is a lady I met in, um, in, in Kenya near the Somalia border, her name is Hawa, and she's her community's uh, data collector. So every day she goes and measures how much rain fell uh, and writes it down in these huge log, log books, and then those make their way into the sort of centralized uh, national weather service of, 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 in this case, Kenya. So um, what, what we did, the first thing that we did is we obtained for uh, in Rwanda, we obtained 30 years of all the records that the country had, all the registered weather stations. I'm just going to play this. It's, I'll fast forward it in a second. But this basically shows you from the, let me take this away, from the 80s to uh, the end of 2016, what, what the stations were doing. So, you know, what the sort of life and death of stations. Um, and you can see, they, they, the country had about, about 100 or so um, weather stations operating pre-Civil War. And then you start seeing the early 90s, they go and they start to disappear. And then in about April 30th, um, the last one disappears. And that, <clears throat> that one reappeared in October, and that's the Kigali Airport. So for about four months, there was no data coming out of the country. Nobody was recording or logging anything about the country's climate. And after this one came back online, it took about um, 489 more days for the next one. And then slowly, um, it started to build up again. Um, but really, it didn't kick in until about 2010, uh, where the government had this sort of big effort to, to, to re, uh, 
rebuild its capacity. I'm going to go back to here. So why does that matter? It matters because we need, every country needs historical data, uh, continuous historical records uh, to, to answer basic questions with any degree of uncertainty. Uh, some, some of them are up here, right? So weather and climate data, they are critical to our, our society, right? They help us forecast weather, obviously. They plan our food production, uh, deal with the uh, coming drought or water shortages, right? They even help us predict epidemics of uh, malaria and dengue and other vector-borne diseases based on how the climate is behaving, in, in, or Zika, in, in, in different parts of the world. So the absence of that resource for Rwanda for that, those 15-plus years um, has left them, have left Rwandans less able to manage climate risks and take advantage of, of um, data sets and resources and tools that other countries may have at their disposal. And so one level, the story that we want to tell with Data Interrupted is going to be about a country's struggle uh, to replace that generation of data uh, and missing records while trying to live in a world that has increasing climate uncertainty. And it matters in Rwanda because, like many of its neighbors, agriculture still plays a huge part of uh, a role in its economy. So I think it's a third of GDP, and 8 out of 10 people in Rwanda are employed in some fashion or another in, in, in the agriculture sector. And that's the most climate sensitive. Uh, but Data Interrupted is also going to be a broader story about the data divide that exists in the world. So this, this image is, is essentially a, a map of weather stations around the world. And what's immediately clear is the, the difference between the countries that have a lot of data and, and those that don't. For example, Germany has, has um, more rain and weather stations than all of Africa combined. And Africa has 80 times the land mass. By 2050, there are going to be fewer Germans on the planet. By 2050, there's going to be a billion more people living in Africa. So, this is going to be a place where having solid records of, of climate is going to be increasingly, increasingly important. Um, because <clears throat> most of where there are no records are like Rwanda, places that have a, uh, depend a lot on rain-fed agriculture. So they don't have an option to irrigate. So they need to know what's happening with rainfall patterns and what's going, going to happen. And without those records or that observational capacity, they're going to be doing it blind. And it's not like. As this might indicate, it's not just Rwanda, although Rwanda is the most dramatic. Madagascar, Tanzania, all of these uh, countries have seen a decline in their observational capacity. Ethiopia, I could show the, something similar for, for Malawi. Um, and the more I report on this issue, the more I think it's kind of starting to pop up in many different parts of the world. Um, I've spoken to people from Cote d'Ivoire, uh, public health researchers, who said the constant conflicts there that destroyed public health records not, are, not, are sort of stymieing their ability to understand how climate and rainfall patterns and temperature patterns have been impacting um, public health issues there. Uh, you can see it in, in, in records in Peru during the time of the Shining Path, Colombia. It's probably happening in Venezuela and Syria as well. And uh, just let, who, who read the, the, the story in the Times, maybe it was last week or the week before, about the treasure trove of ISIS documents that they found in, in Iraq, right? There was one paragraph in there that just sort of blew my mind because I think uh, it kind of justifies or at least value, uh, puts value on the kind of the things that we're, we're looking at, which is this, sent, this paragraph here, right? So in Iraq, there are data gaps. Data is interrupt, being interrupted. And this was, this was the person that they were interviewing was the guy that used to work or was working or is working for the Ministry of Agriculture. So <clears throat> we keep arriving at that same idea, right? There, um, that the data is kind of an invaluable resource, like water, seeds, um, and minerals, right? Some places have more of it than others. Some places have it, then lose it, and that loss is not insignificant. Um, and what I'd like to also do is kind of go beyond Rwanda and go beyond the 90s, right, and say, like, why does it matter you know, why does it still matter to Rwandans of today? And why does it matter to the rest of the world? Because I've spoken to climate scientists and say, like, these gaps in the data are thwarting efforts to pin down where and how climate change is going to impact people, uh, especially in the, in, in the developing world. 
And, and also, as we try to understand and establish responsibility or accountability, accountability among the developed countries for funding climate adaptation efforts. I mean, there's going to be billions and billions of dollars poured into these adaptation funds. And without knowing, um, without having adequate data resources, um, you know, it might be efforts that are not well, uh, well spent. Um, and of course, there's also um, threats to data streams that don't fit current, you know, political narratives, right, about science or climate, and, and, and that's not a problem just the developing world. So in, in, like I said, on the 23rd or 24th, I'm leaving. I'm, I'll be arriving in Kigali. And uh, I'm going to try to get the, try to put faces behind some of these issues uh, uh, that, I, that I've talked about. And uh, one of the things is letting the data drive some of the reporting. So these, these pins are the, some of those stations that first came back online. And so I have uh, scheduled to interview some of the people that were collect, some of the people like that lady that I, uh, whose picture I showed before, who were the data collectors in these communities during the time of the genocide and, and afterwards, and trying to get their stories. Because in, in, they're very interesting because they're in rural areas, and rural areas are ex the most vulnerable when it comes to climate impacts. Um, and then, of course, they were also the sites of uh, a lot of violence and death. Um, but people like this, right? So almost every place I go to in the course of my job for reporting uh, uh, work, I meet people that collect rainfall for their village, right? And to me, there's this beautiful arc on this sort of either end of a data pipeline that starts with people like this and ends with like people like these who are climate scientists running these big models um, using data from, from all whatever resources, whatever, um, whatever points they can find and references they can then have, because the more the data that they can have that's high quality, the better the, the, the models uh, are likely to turn out. Um, and let's see, so just throwing up some questions here that are kind of currently on my mind is, uh, um, so ahead of the Iraq, the first Iraq war, do you remember the push for, um, by international sort of cultural institutions to try to save or protect the, the heritage of the country, right? So I wonder if there's things like that that are being thought about for data resources and data wealth, right? Because Syrians may not, data may not be on the top of the mind of many people right now, uh, given all the tragedy and all the other um, destruction that they're facing. But five years from now, 10 years from now, th those data are going to be val invaluable. And, and then, again, you know, trying to understand where does data loss fit? It's not, genocide obviously is, is way, way, way uh, on, on the top of the list, um, but trying to get across how it matters and why it's significant. And, and then also just to make it uh, relevant to Americans who may not think too much about Rwanda or two decades ago. Anyway, thanks a lot. Francesco. Francesco, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's terrific. Uh, and as you say, you know, we talked this morning about, not sorry, not this morning, early this afternoon about what constitutes public record. And we don't often or always think about data in that context. And now we clearly should as well. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good luck, good luck with the trip. Thanks so much. Um, hey, panel, come on up. <laughs> um, I just want to say a couple of things uh, to lead us off uh, about my own organization and a few of the programs that I think are really relevant to what's going on here. The Metropolitan New York Library Council is a membership organization for libraries, archives, and museums in New York City. We have 250 plus or minus uh, members ranging from giant libraries to little tiny archives with like one person working at them. And we have a studio over in Hell's Kitchen, where one of the things that we offer is access to equipment for media format migration and digitiza digitization of all kinds. Um, so we have a, a rack of equipment for all of those crazy old uh, Betamax tapes that you're all stressed out about. Um, and we, uh, we also have a, a, we're really excited about a program that um, we got Mellon Foundation support for called Preserve This Podcast. Um, our studio manager is leading this effort, and this is an effort to, I think she says it's something like, we want podcast producers to 
be as likely to uh, submit their files to the Internet Archive as they are to uh, buckle their seat belts. So that's kind of fun. And then finally, um, we have a conference coming up that um, I know you're, we're here on the West Coast, but for those back on the East Coast or those who are interested in catching the live stream uh, on May 31st and June 1st, uh, called Misinformed, uh, Propaganda, Disinformation, Misinformation, and Our Culture. Uh, we've confirmed a keynote with Dana Boyd from Data and Society. Uh, it should be pretty awesome. If you go to metro.org slash misinformed, you'll see where we're planning everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to that point, wow, we've got an awesome panel of folks here. Um, I'm really excited to, uh, to introduce them and start and keep on kind of poking at some of the questions that we were uh, getting at earlier. Um, this is a moment where we're going to start to talk about whose responsibility it is to keep the public record. Um, we've heard from folks who are doing it, and we're going to work on trying to kind of define what is the public record as well. So I'm going to um, I'm going to try to make this kind of lively. Um, I have questions that these guys are ready for, but maybe we'll mix it up a little bit, and they'll start talking to each other a little bit. It should be fun. Um, with that, I'm going to pass this mic around, or I don't have to pass it around. Mm -hmm. You have your own mics. Yes, we're live. Can you um, introduce yourself briefly and uh, pass it along down the, the chain? Sure. My name is Alex Howard. I'm the deputy director of the Sunlight Foundation. A couple of years ago, I was a fellow at the Tau Center. Over to you. Hi, I'm Victoria Baronetsky, and I'm the general counsel at the Center for Investigative Reporting, which puts out Reveal. Mm. Um, and I am currently a Tau fellow. Mm. Good afternoon. I'm Regina Roberts. I'm a librarian here at Stanford University. I'm, I work in collection development, and my areas that I cover are anthropology and archaeology, communication and journalism, feminist studies, and Lusophone Africa. I'm Karen Cariani. I'm executive director of the WGBH Media Library and Archives in Boston and project <coughs> director for the American Archives of Public Broadcasting in collaboration with the Library of Congress. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Samick. I'm a senior product manager at YouTube, leading the news and combating misinformation piece of YouTube. Um, I've been at Google actually for about four and a half years, only about six months in this role. And I used to own a little indie uh, news site that I ran for quite some time before Google. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you all. This is going to be really fun. So uh, Alex, mm. I'm going to kick it off with you. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about your work? the Sunlight Foundation, and can you explain how you would historically define the public record? Okay. And how would you define the public record right now? Mm. And help me out with that question. Whose responsibility is it to gather, preserve, and create access to the public record? Well, one of those questions is a lot easier than the others, know. so I'll start with that. Um, we're a national nonpartisan nonprofit. We've been around since 2006. Uh, we focus on open government, try to make uh, politics and government more transparent. Uh, we started it with Congress, then we expanded it to executive, executive branches, then we moved to every level of government. Um, so journalism plus technology plus policy, um, trying to make things work better. Um, and our, the big idea is pretty straightforward. Governments should use the internet to share information with people directly. Um, that just asking, for uh, just asking for information or suing for it under the Freedom of Information Act or other laws isn't enough, right? We should be using technology to empower people with information, to arm them with information, as James Madison once said. Um, and we've used technology historically as part of that. Um, 2016, we went through a bit of a governance shift and we closed down a labs division. Now, up to that point, our labs division was a big part of that answer. Right? We had tried to show government how to do it better ourselves. And over the course of a decade, we raised tens of millions of dollars from foundations and individuals to do just that. Um, things like preserving uh, social media updates, something called Politubes, which ProPublica now operates. Um, or scraping and structuring data uh, that was mangled in PDFs or in images or not digital. Um, to create better records that were machine readable, which could be analyzed and give people insight to what's happening. Um, we, as I said, went through a transition a couple of years ago, which I was present for and have come out the other side of, uh, let's say, a, a little bit burnt. Um, I learned a lot. And one of the things that, that I've been reflecting upon is whose responsibility is it? Now, he asked a hard question. What is the public record? 
Well, we can go back in time quite a long way. As long as there's been civilization, as long as there's a culture, someone is in charge of keeping the record, right? Could be in a cuneiform tablet, could be scratching charcoal on a wall. Once you start to get to things like papyrus, there is something which someone is accountable for to keep track of things. Calends, right? The things that the Romans used to put up in the forum kept track of the public record of dates for people. So as long as we've had governments, someone's in charge of the record, and of course that information is powerful. Once you start to get into today, it's a lot more complicated, particularly when you have phenomena like public discourse being hosted on private platforms. Whose job is it to preserve that? Whose job is it to preserve government websites? Holy moly, looks like the Wayback Machine's super important. <laughs> That's not how it's supposed to be. Part of my job is to advocate for changes in the laws, rules, regulations, to make it sure that civic infrastructure isn't neglected in the digital age. It is very much a part of what we do. Um, and we use a lot of different tools and techniques. Sometimes I go talk to people directly, sometimes I write about them, sometimes we tweet about them. Yes, that's very effective these days. And by doing so, we hope to see that what is the public's taxpayer-funded information is preserved and is accessible, and that is a word that's quite charged, of course, because accessible these days might mean making sure that someone's picture is accessible to someone who needs it read to them. Unfortunately, lots of news organizations neglect that, but so too do government agencies, even those that are supposed to know better. This is an incredibly difficult moment and I think people here in this room know this. In DC, I know it as well, because we have now arguments about the responsibilities of different institutions to maintain accurate records, not to change things without telling people that they're doing so, not to shift public access, not to obfuscate. We used to have security by obscurity, privacy by obscurity. Those things are being blown up very quickly. But we also have things like uh, opacity by obscurity. Right? If you take away a link to something, it's not indexed anymore. Does it truly exist in the public record? Now, whose job it is varies. In um, the countries of many of our allies or friends who are trying to do our work, they may not have statistical agencies. They may not have government institutions which keep the records. And so it ends up being the news media's job. It ends up being archivist jobs. It ends up being librarians jobs. It ends up being teachers jobs to keep things constant. There was a fairly large period of time, several centuries ago, where it was the job actually of monks to preserve records, right? And they did a quite a good job at it. So it depends upon the period of time. It depends upon the context we live in. Right now, thank goodness, ProPublica took over one of our tools called Politools to preserve tweets of politicians. You know who tends to delete some tweets? They do. <laughs> now that the president is issuing statements on Twitter, which may or may not be drafted by him, some of them almost certainly are, some of them almost certainly are not, and then deletes them, it's incredibly important that those have a record. Now the White House has told the National Archives that we are definitely preserving those. We're not convinced. We certainly aren't convinced that things like direct messages are preserved. I hate that we're talking about this. I I hate that there is a question about this. I hate that during the transition there was great national fear that public data was going to be deleted, that websites were going to go offline, that we had to have huge network efforts in data refuge, data rescue, that this edgy group got spun up. I hate that we have a project at Sunlight now which is expressly dedicated to using software, using the Wayback Machine, and figuring out what's been changed without telling anybody. That there is a question about the scientific integrity of the information that the government is putting out. That the word of our White House has been diminished to the extent that we can no longer say that whitehouse.gov is as trustworthy as it used to be. This is not how it's supposed to be. I am hopeful that it's going to get better. But it's going to get worse before it does. So, it sounds like we're in a real pickle, and you've got a lot more to say about it. <laughs> um, yes, things are fermenting. So. I'm going to turn over to Vicky for a sec and ask you to riff on this for just a moment hmm. uh, and see where that goes. What do you think about this pickle? What are you seeing in your work? Sure. Um, 
So as a media lawyer, uh, I think it's interesting that for many years, for about 30 years, libel law was sort of the bread and butter for media attorneys. And so the majority of cases that were in a general counsel's office had to do with defamation. When I graduated from law school, um, which was about 10 years ago, um, you could see a big shift that was happening. And a majority of cases that are in front of a general counsel's desk have to, in, fa in fact, are for freedom of information. Um, so there are Freedom of Information Act requests. There are plenty of libel cases as well that are now growing once again um, due to a recent upswing. But for the most part, a lot of cases that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are Freedom of Information Act requests cases. Um, within that body of law, I think that there are three particular trends that are fascinating. One of them is uh, based on this thing called the Glomar defense. So as many of you know, right, there is a Freedom of Information Act, which is a federal law, and then every state has its own Freedom of Information legislation. And for the Freedom of Information Act national law, in the 1970s there was a case, and a bunch of journalists wanted to have information on um, a ship. It was called the USS Glomar and it was used to retrieve information that was coming from a Russian ship that was at the bottom of the ocean. And so the CIA used the Glomar to retrieve this information and pull it back up. And so when the journalists asked for information about the Glomar, they got a response from the CIA that it had never given before, which is, we can neither confirm nor deny that these documents even exist, which was preposterous, right? It's like the most obfuscated response you can possibly give. It's saying just the fact that these, saying that these documents exist, it's not even that I'm gonna redact, it's not even that I'm gonna say that they're exempt under a law enforcement exemption, which would have normally happened. But instead, this time, the CIA is saying, you know what, I'm not even gonna say, acknowledge their existence. And very sadly, in that case, in the 70s, the court upheld the decision, the, the government's response. What is unfortunate is that the Glomar response since 9-11 has expanded beyond belief. So the Glomar response after 9-11 started using, being used for almost everything from the moon to the sun um, to the stars dealing with national security. And so things that even tangentially touch national security now, you know, claims about um, racial violence, um, claims about people being stopped at the airport, any document that touched something involving something that could be even a little bit framed as a national security risk got a Glomar response. Okay, so that was already kind of a pickle. Um, to get to the fermentation process of even more of that is that more recently, states have started using Glomar responses. Now you might think, okay, well, yeah, if the federal government does it, shouldn't the state be able to do it? But here's the thing, FOIA itself, the law, doesn't have a Glomar response in it. It only has nine exemptions written into the law that are the ways with which the government can withhold records. This was a court-created doctrine. The court said, yeah, government, you can use this exemption, that you can use this excuse. Now states, which are regulated under their own rules, which has nothing to do with FOIA, they each have their own little, New York has FOIL, California has the CPRA, the California Public Records Act, right? They have their own laws. And now those state agencies are importing the Glomar Doctrine. And so just this past month, New York ruled, New York courts ruled that the New York state agencies could give a Glomar response. Um, some journalists had asked for records about racial profiling that was done by the NYPD. The NYPD gave back a Glomar response and the courts upheld it. Hmm. Uh, so, so this is one pickle. I, I don't know if I have time for all three, but yeah. <laughs> so, so one, I, I, have, I have a suggestion as to how we can circumvent some of these problems, but let me just lay out the rest of the problems. Um, two of the other big ones are search. So as these agencies have, as data has grown, right, we're living in an unbelievably abundant data society. Um, there is so much information that is out there, 
And sadly, government is not in the position of Silicon Valley. They do not have the same kind of search optimization that Silicon Valley companies have. And so their ability to get a request and then go through the millions of documents that are now being created is very difficult. However, they also haven't updated their technology. So the FBI, for instance, their search mechanisms are the same ones that they used in the 90s. This is on the record, which has now been like found out in a FOIA request that was done by someone named Ryan Shapiro, who's a very well-known FOIA requester. Um, and so I think that agencies have been more, they're required under the law, FOIA requires that agencies do a reasonable search. But I would pose the question, is it a reasonable search if your technology isn't being kept up to date with what the requirements are to sift through millions of documents. So agencies nowadays are constantly giving, oh, we did a reasonable search and we weren't able to find anything. Lo and behold, you file a lawsuit saying it wasn't sufficient and you find something. So a good example of this is there's an organization called Freedom of the Press Foundation and when I, I had worked for them on a pro bono basis and they had requested a document from the FBI involving procedures that they had to search journalists. And the agency said, we can't find anything. And after the lawsuit was filed, The Intercept somehow found this document and published it. And even when we brought it to the court saying, hey, somehow The Intercept was able to get their hands on this, don't you think the FBI's search maybe wasn't reasonable then? The court said, well, we, we think that it was reasonable enough for their standards. So that's a prop. That's obviously a very big issue. And the last one I'll try to say very concisely is that, uh, and I think this is something that we really should talk more about hopefully here today, is, you know, FOIA is focused on government records. But I think in today's day and age, as we live in a structure of society where corporations are becoming potentially just as powerful as government entities, the question about transparency for corporations, I really feel like is there needs to be more pressure put on that um, and, and requirements for there to be transparency around the same type of transparency we require of our government, we should require of these, these companies. Um, and so requests, unfortunately, are now the, the they're being uh, used by companies, Silicon Valley companies. And I would argue um, that there needs to be put in place questions about who has access to those requests first. Should journalists maybe get preference? Should companies? Um, and where else should we be focusing our transparency efforts? So these are great questions. And I, I expect that we'll be, uh, we'll be hearing from the audience about uh, some of those issues uh, as we go. I'd like to take it over to library land for a second. Uh, Regina, as we sit here uh, at the university you work at, and uh, get you to talk for a second, because it relates directly back to all of this stuff, um, about your work with the Open Policing Project, which is totally amazing. Um, and can you just tell us a bit about it, and maybe speak to some of the privacy challenges associated uh, with making those records widely available? Um, sure. Thanks. So in my role as collection development librarian, right, I'm, all, I'm thinking about um, bringing in collections for my researchers, working with researchers here, finding out what their needs are, and in speaking with uh, faculty members in the uh, communication and journalism department, um, we found out that you know, they were working on bringing in uh, this policing data, and uh, my question to them was, well, where will that policing, all that hard work that you're putting in to get the FOIA, do the FOIA request, the public records request, the cleaning of the data, the um, harmonizing of the data, that was all done by um, Cheryl Phillips and Sherrod Goyel and, and um, their team, and I, maybe I should give a little more background for those of you who don't know what the open policing data set is, but it's, um, data that they, they requested from, the United, from uh, different states across the United States um, on police stop data. And um, they built some algorithms that helped to, uh, and their team of uh, PhD students built some algorithms to help harmonize the data so that it could be comparable across states. And also, uh, there's all, 
lots of other opportunities for stories within that data, and they've been sharing it with other journalists and um, other researchers. And so the idea is that they've done all this work, they've collected, they've done the public records requests. Some things came in, some things didn't. You know, some requests were denied. Um, they've they harmonized the data, they cleaned it, and where would it where would it live? Where would it be uh, available to others? Uh, so at Stanford, we have the Stanford Digital Repository, uh, which is a, a local repository for Stanford projects um, and for things that we as curators believe is important for our community to have access to. Um, but it, it wasn't built for like uh, this type of social science data per se. So there are some issues about uh, getting it in there and making it accessible. So we, we had to do some um, workarounds to make that possible, but it, it, it lives there and now it has a permanent um, location and we're committed to keeping it for the long term and also looking at ways of building out more sort of like big local um, collections like that that uh, journalists and investigative reporters collect because in my conversations with um, investigative reporters and just even hearing uh, folks here today, they do collect all this rich data, and report on it um, in a timely manner and, and then <coughs> what happens to that data? Sometimes it gets archived where in their news org um, and then that news organization gets sold to another news um, organization and the servers get shut down and then that data is lost so there's some of that going on and we'd like to try to see where we could um, actually be a refuge for some of that data so I'm continuing to work with uh, the, these faculty members to see how we can um, continue to build similar uh, data sets and we have to think through, right, whether or not we can put the raw data in um, or, I mean, maybe there are some ethical issues. Like in anthropology, the anthropologists here often think that uh, they don't want to put their interview data in because it puts some of their informants at risk. And so that's an issue that we have to think through, too. And, and those, some of the other data archive, archivists have to think through those kinds of ethical questions in the process. And um, in libraries, we don't really want to make people register to have access for the, to the data um, because we want people to have that free access. But in some cases, it might be important to think through whether or not we do have a reg someone register for the raw data so that they can um, so that we know they're using it in an ethical way or that we have a way of tracking down if some um, unethical use of the data happen, you know, happens. So those are some of the things that we have to think through and um, getting the data into the repository. We have to think about describing all the different fields, having really good solid code books um, of the data so that it's reused and, and people understand the way it was collected and the way um, it can be reused without um, distorting uh, the statistical nature of the data, right? And um, so I do, I do want to mention that there is a social science standard for describing data and the um, Data Document um, Initiative Alliance is a really good source for um, doing that and it's a source that's been used uh, since the 90s and developed through um, like the UK data archives and ICPSR and so other social science type of data uh, repositories. So those are some of the things that we're looking at in terms of being able to make our sharing of the data better and the reuse of the data that we're collecting and preserving um, Better. Cool. Who, who yeah. do you think should be helping you with this work? Who, who should be supporting this work? And, and, and who are the ideal partners? Well, ideal <laughs> partners, um, yeah, so a lot of this, uh, to make in, in order to make uh, our 
repository have all the multiple bells and whistles that would be required to do all these things, we need, develop, we need to develop more and um, we would need funding for developers. Um, so right now the way, we, the way things work is that we write grants and hopefully you know, it's piecemeal really um, in a lot of ways. But I think as, as research shifts and we're seeing it shift rapidly and we're seeing people um, using uh, text and data analysis tools more and more. It's, it is, I think it's helpful to think of that as a new form of reading, that using um, R and Python and, and doing text and data um, analysis on large corpus of, of data that's collected. And it could be unstructured or structured data you know, that you're pulling in and archiving. Um, it's kind of a new form of reading, and so let's, uh, let's build our tools to make that happen. And, and things like uh, video content, like having transcripts um, and tools that make transcripts easier and less expensive to produce out of video content would be awesome for archives like us. And so I'd love to have partnerships with um, uh, developers who are working on that. Alex, you want to say something to that? I, I want to make two quick points. One, to what, something that she mentioned. Privatization moves government services into private companies. It happens every single time is what where public records then become shielded from scrutiny. So if you look at a point of advocacy, make sure that as privatization occurs, FOIA, whatever, at the state or national level, now includes what were public services. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about the public record, this is crucial. If it becomes privatized, then it's shielded from scrutiny. The second, openpolicing.stanford.edu is the site. And what they've done is incredibly important, because she hasn't talked about the power of the data itself and what it showed mm -hmm. about how policing is being enforced. We talk about the public record. Then FBI Director Comey told Congress and the public that he was embarrassed because The Guardian and The Washington Post had done a better job of tracking the use of force by police departments including when people died or been injured. And he said, the DOJ needs to do better. Unfortunately, that is the reality of much of our country, which is much better off than a lot of the rest of the world. We're having our different news organizations, including a, you know, a foreign one, um, track how our own law enforcement is using force against the public. This is an incredibly important data set, an incredibly important set of interactions. And of course now, we're talking about body cam video mm -hmm. or smartphone video, which is clearly part of the public record, or Facebook Live video, clearly part of the public record showing murder or other kinds of issues. And this kind of project is helping to retain that for public inspection. And I wanted to call that out and also give the URL because it's yeah. cool. an extraordinary project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm sure we're going to come back to this, but I want to move along as you're all sitting patiently down there. Um, earlier this month, uh, Ethan Zuckerman, the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT Media Lab, wrote a piece on Medium that highlighted four problems for news and democracy. They're addiction, economics, bad actors, and known bugs. <laughs> I think it's a great read. Everybody should read it. Um, and at the end, he concluded, uh, it's unlikely that there's a solution to this set of problems without insisting on the necessity of news for participation in a democracy, which opens, which opens options too seldom considered in our country where market solutions are always preferred. News may be too important to leave to the whims of the market, whether that means financing public media providers that are positioned to give us the essential facts of the world we live in, or building a robust set of membership models that allow a small set of subscribers to make critical information available to wider audiences, there are solutions to the problem of financing the news. Unfortunately, these solutions are rarely popular because they're expensive and hard to sell in the US where they run counter to conventional thinking about markets and speech. So I was hoping to get a reaction to that from both uh, Karen and Jeff. Uh, particularly around the market solutions versus publicly funded solutions uh, piece. So Karen, could you lead on that and sort of tell us a little bit about what you're up to at WGBH to start? So Thanks. WGBH is public media in Boston. We produce about a third of the programming that goes out on PBS. Um, 
And of course, I would support more funding for public media. Um, I actually do believe that it is a nonpartisan objective source of information. Um, according to the public people, it is the most trusted network in the country. Um, and that said, we, are, we aren't fully funded by the government. In fact, we are very smallly funded by the government. We are most much funded by you, viewers like you. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, and that said, um, in particular, the archive. You know, uh, GBH has now been on the air for 50 years. Uh, 60 years actually. Frontline is one of the most public mm -hmm. affair, watched public affairs programming in the country. Um, it, we have a vast archive. We save not only the broadcast programs, but all of the interviews, the full length interviews that they conduct. I would love to make that material available to you guys, to anybody, to researchers. Um, it's expensive. It is expensive to manage an archive, um, as Anu was saying. Migrating this material to a digital format is expensive, and there is very little funding available to do this. The federal government, you have grants from NEH, and that's it. Yeah. Maybe NHPRC, but they have such a small pot of money. Uh, CLEAR is actually funded by Mellon, which is a private foundation. Mm -hmm. So there is very little money in this space to be able to preserve these older materials, particularly the news materials and public affairs materials. And um, you know, we look at it and we look at the costs, not only once you migrate it to digital, as Steve was saying, the actual cost of keeping it digital and keeping it accessible. Storage may be going down, but the volume of material that you need to keep is growing. So your costs aren't going down at all. If nothing else, they're continuing to grow. Um, I, I think the government, well, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to step back and, and contradict myself. I actually think the government should be putting huge amounts of funds into preserving public media, if nothing, if nothing else, um, in order to preserve the public record. The news, the material that the public has funded over the years, all of this great programming and all of this information that, as a data set, does create a picture of our country and our cultural heritage over time. And I think that's a really important record to keep and to make available as a data set and make available to researchers. That said, as they say, and I think Stanford is the one that actually came up with the term locks, lots of, thi lots of copies keeps things safe. So there's a part of me that says maybe the federal government should be paying to keep this material in the archives. We do have this American Archive of Public Broadcasting project uh, in collaboration with the Library of Congress where the Library of Congress is keeping the preservation files. Um, WGBH is uh, managing the access piece of it. Um, that said, I would actually think that another institution with a long-term history would be great to partner with us to keep yet another copy, um, to keep a yet another copy in another place so that it's not necessarily just in the hands of one entity being the government, who knows what will happen, um, but in another institution also. And it shouldn't necessarily just be in one institution. That's my, my personal opinion. Um, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, was funded by CPB, which is the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, a federally funded agency that then funds public media. Um, we had over, they funded over 100 local stations across the country, digitize about 40,000 items um, for the initial collection. We have proceeded to grow the collection. We are currently digitizing the NewsHour collection up to 2007. Uh, through a grant with CLEAR though, however, not through a grant from the federal government. So the NewsHour collection will be digitized. I was just talking to the Internet Archive saying we've got a gap now because we're only digitizing up to 2007. How do we then get the next gap from 2007 to the present? And thank goodness they've been off air recording the NewsHour from there, so we'll have that whole collection. Um, and we want to make this available. Um, you know, again, my opinion is that keeping these archives are expensive. What's the point of keeping them if they can't be made available to the public, if they can't be used as research, if they can't be used as public record? Um, so we're trying to push out as much as possible. There are rights issues, as always, so we have to be careful about honoring rights and copyrights and liability um, issues, and we, we're doing our best at trying to do that, but trying to make as much available as possible. Um, did I answer the question? <laughs> Sounded great, yeah. Um, um, so a lot, of, a lot of our funding is coming from grants and projects, and um, it's just not enough. The material is going to disintegrate in the next five to ten years, and that 
that mm. history of that time period will be gone. Any um, audiovisual materials from that space, if you haven't migrated to digital form, will be gone. All of those older formats, as Anu said, are deteriorating on the tapes themselves, and the, the decks are becoming unavailable, and the people who can even run and repair the decks are retiring and dying. So there was a study that came out that basically said we have five to ten years to take this piece of history and migrate it into a digital form and into the future. Um, yeah. Yes. It's a crisis. It's, <laughs> yeah, it really it is. is. A crisis. It really is. Um, and there is, again, very little funding in this space. Yeah. Um, philanthropists, possibly. Foundations, possibly. The problem with private foundations, we've kind of gone down this route, is that they have um, very clear programs that they are willing to fund and usually has to do with social impact. Um, so we have to make the case, of course, but they're not into the business of preservation. So, so where do we I turn? I think that's a really, I, I'd like to comment Please. on that because um, I think that's a really challenging area for us too in the libraries is that we, we uh, need funding for processing um, collections, creating the metadata, all of those things cost money and it's not really like a sexy thing to fund. You know, it's not a building, it's not something you put a big plaque on. So um, I, I'd like to see like a more shift in the way we think about these things. Like uh, if we think about that presentation that was right before us about the, the data that was lost in, um, in Rwanda, it, it's like it, it matters to us for other reasons besides uh, what's happening in some local place. And these are the steps that we need to take as a society, right, to preserve um, uh, openness and um, uh, transparency in our social settings and government. To, to that magnetic yeah. media crisis, I want to give a shout out to two different projects that are important, the Transfer Collective, who are a bunch of folks who do this kind of work in their spare time. And uh, also to the um, Memory Lab and the Memory Lab Network out of uh, the DC Public Library and now nationally because of an IMLS grant that are creating more opportunity for the, the preservation of these kinds of materials. It's a bit of a, it's, it's, it's definitely another pickle. Um, in the interest of making sure that there's time for everybody to ask questions, I'd like to hop to the next question for you, Jeff. That's sure. okay? You're cool and with that? And by the way, we should talk about YouTube. Yes, we should talk about YouTube. Yeah, since we like do a lot of video and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good yeah, idea. We have a pretty good relationship uh, with you guys. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of content that exists on YouTube right now. I know, now. we don't it's tell our legal department. Oh. <laughs> don't Twitter that. <laughs> we're, we're on Facebook Live. Which is right, right, right. <laughs> nice. Well, I would love for you to have your content on our platform legally, so. We would too, actually. There you go. All right. Look at this, we got something done. This is great. <laughs> um, Jeff, uh, when I worked in public libraries, there was a debate amongst administrators and collection development specialists about whether the library should uh, kind of give them what they want or whether librarians had this important curatorial role in making sure that the library was filled with important, accurate knowledge coming from a variety of different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see this as analogous to the platform position that you come from at YouTube News. Uh, just like the librarians aren't the ones writing the books, YouTube isn't publishing the, the content so much as providing access to it. So here we sit in this great crisis of disappearing facts and disappearing data, um, the widely acknowledged crisis about the self-reinforcing feedback loops in online media. Um, and you guys have this massive back catalog uh, or library of video content. So where do you think um, the opportunities lie and, and where is your responsibility? Hmm. Yeah, I think the short answer is that there are a lot of opportunities and we do feel responsible. Mm. Um, I think, you know, a little bit leading in from the last question here is, um, you know, there's a ton of content out there and it's open and it's available to everyone. I think there's a lot of great content made available through our partnerships. That's super high quality. Uh, you, can, you can watch C-SPAN archived on YouTube. You can watch tons of local television, uh, publicly funded television. You could see our city council. I watched the UK public hearing on fake news uh, on YouTube. Like you can, there's lots of interesting stuff that's available there. I think um, we feel responsible for preserving 
uh, and organizing the world's information. So I think this is a critical part, right? So it's sort of part of our DNA to want to do this. So I think we should do it more. Uh, in terms of the, you know, the question about uh, lots of viewpoints, there are lots of viewpoints on YouTube. Um, I think you know, we do a good job of surfacing them on the surfaces that are specifically dedicated to news. I think you see a variety of those things. They're from very authoritative sources. They're very prominent on our homepage and our search results. But I think there's also places where we don't do very well, right? Um, and so one of the things you mentioned as part of your question is like, you know, do we give them what, we, what they want as our users? I think it's a mix, right? And I think the YouTube analogy is not quite like the library analogy uh, in that libraries only have a limited amount of shelf space. So they make some editorial decision in terms of what books they choose to have on their shelves. We don't make any choices like that. We allow everything on our shelves, so to speak. Um, so I think that's a bit of a different case. And well, so that I would have to mm -hmm. object to that a little bit because in libraries now, like especially mm -hmm. research libraries, we have digital stacks mm -hmm. that are shelves. So it's not that it's completely just physical. <laughs> sure, I think that's, that's definitely yeah. true. Um, so there's definitely more room to do that. But I think that, um, you know, because of that, I think when it comes to if anyone searches for something on YouTube, I think they sort of have the right to find it if it's a, within the policy of our site to keep it up on our site. Um, at the same time, then we have layered on top of that recommendation systems. And I think that's where responsibility comes in, uh, where we have to say it's, an, it's under our power to control these things, and we should optimize for responsible behavior, especially around things like news. And I think that's where we've actually taken a lot of good action in the last year, uh, where we, we put news on our homepage regularly. I think the raid on, uh, on Trump's lawyer last week was you know, homepage all day on YouTube with a lot of great uh, authoritative sources about that information. We run that on our homepage regularly. This is, the homepage is generally something that's done through a recommendation system. Essentially, all of our systems, what people want is on the page. Uh, but this is not driven by any of those factors. It's driven by us feeling responsible to get this information out to the world. So I think we have a responsibility. I think we're just starting to really show that, but I think we have a long way to go. Before I open this up to questions from everyone, is it, does anyone else on the panel want to address anyone else on the panel? Anything that you all have, you guys are like, we're done. Uh, no, I, I actually have no. a couple of things I wanted Please. to say, too, about yes. um, some of my colleagues who are government information librarians and, and the work that they do um, in working on getting government agencies to put on their websites you know, a statement that says, this is a Creative Commons type work. You are welcome to archive it. Because getting those, especially in state and local government documents, getting those into our collections through our digital stacks, um, we have to always get permissions and, and working on that. And even though it is uh, public information, sometimes those reports are created by um, private agencies and so they are copyrighted. And it would be really nice and helpful to us as people who are trying to archive that for future research and future generations and for transparency if those agencies would uh, play along nicely, at least on their website. <laughs> Some simple things that they could do. Yeah. I, I do have one question. Please. So um, I was just at a panel yesterday, this is about YouTube, and um, it, this, this came up and I thought it was really interesting how essentially on YouTube, I wonder how difficult it is, um, the fact that unlike a library, you are a business, and so therefore there are certain requirements to maintain the profitability of the site and how mm -hmm. that interrupts the algorithms as to, like you say, you know, the curation and the suggestions. And one of the examples that came up was about CAL FIRES, and that mm -hmm. when you apparently put in CAL FIRES, on the site with parentheses mainstream afterwards, hmm. and forgive me, I, I might have the exact like search keywords, um, it would pop up a whole bunch of non-mainstream sort of fake newsy type things about the CAL FIRES um, because those were more clickable. Um, hmm. And so therefore the way that this was explained to us at this panel on algorithms um, is that there was an incentive, a market incentive, because otherwise, if you didn't include those things, 
no one would click. Um, so because otherwise, if you are looking for a mainstream thing, you're looking for like the CBS or the ABC coverage, and you just keep scrolling because you want to see that precise one. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if you could provide more insight on that. Yeah, sure. I think the history of the algorithms is interesting. I think it, it's evolved a lot. And I think from the YouTube perspective, clicks were something that were optimized for. At this point, though, that was like eight years ago. Uh, I think we realized very quickly, for even the health of our platform, optimizing toward clicking on things is a problem, because clickbait takes over really quickly. And it's bad for everyone. It's bad for our business as well. So I think these days, clicks is actually minimally optimized for uh, on that YouTube search result. So I'm, I'm not sure on that specific one, and digging in is always tricky uh, with these. But I would say that you know, we want to optimize for uh, things that are good for our users' consumption in the long run. One of the interesting things that we found is that when we attacked clickbait or, or things that were, you know, a lot of those conspiracies are very clickbaity, um, we implemented systems to reduce that. There was absolutely a hit in the short term of people that clicked and watched on those videos. But what we actually saw is that in the long term, we saw growth there. Uh, so that doing the right thing was actually both good for a society and good for a platform. So I think that was a really profound lesson that we got a few years ago, that we have led to more fundamental changes to algorithms that include things that I think are generally perceived as more societally good. Uh, so there are definitely, you know, again, we have 1.5 billion hours of watch time a day and 450 hours a minute of uploaded content, right? So there's, you can pick a search and find something wrong, I promise you. And that probably will be true forever. Um, but I think we've made a lot of strides and improvements overall to try and optimize for things that are better. All right, at this point, we're going to take it out to the audience. Um, and I'm just going to start with you right there. Um, hi, my name is Xin Feng, and I am a John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University. I'm also together with several of my colleagues here. Um, I just wonder, um, I think the government is intrinsically unwilling to be transparent, and then they might follow the uh, FOIA, but they do it passively um, by providing low quality data. I just wonder, um, I want to hear um, all of your thoughts on what incentives um, can we provide governments to provide more data and high quality data, meaning um, data that are up to date, complete, searchable, structured, and ideally uh, in different formats. Um, so. In other words, what benefits can they see in providing uh, better data? I, I, can I take that? I think that's like a great point. Um, David Posen, who's a professor at Columbia Law School, put out a really wonderful paper about FOIA. And he actually tears it apart. And he says, you know what? This statute actually puts citizens um, in tension with government um, because you're constantly begging the government and you're giving them all the power to deny you and to not let you see what is behind the curtain. Um, and so, and I, I have to say that having litigated many FOIA actions over the past few years, um, it's only gotten increasingly worse, right? It used to be um, appeal, appeal, appeal is what people would say. And that's the only way you would get a response. And now it seems to be the only way your response is sue, 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 right? It has to be taken all the way to the step of a lawsuit to get um, information. So there are certainly challenges under FOIA, the way it's structured. Uh, I think that you know, for transparency advocates and attorneys, what we've, you know, a lot of people have discussed is having more proactive requirements. So for example, OIP, the Office of Information Policy itself, now I think it was in 2007 started publishing reports on itself because there was so much pushback as to the problems with FOIA. And so now OIP requires from every agency its FOIA statistics every year, including like how many requests they got, um, how many they responded to, all that. And OIP collects all that data and then they publish it in a yearly report. And these reports are actually fascinating. Well, maybe to some of us they're fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but so ultimately, I think that that example is a good one, which is, I think, in addition, I think FOIA needs to be there, right? Because there are going to be circumstances where you need the checks and balances. Because essentially, FOIA is for the executive branch. And when you have FOIA, you allow for the judiciary to step in 
and this is a separation of the powers bit, right? You allow for another branch of the government to step in and say, no, you know what, you gotta turn that over. You have to show that, but that, that process takes a really long time. But maybe for the intervening steps, or maybe to enable that a little bit more, we should have a push for more um, self-publishing modes of transparency where we require reports from different agencies in order to do that. I think that's a very, very good idea as an addition to FOIA, which I do also think is necessary for the separation of balance, separation of powers bit that I just discussed. So I, I what she said, <laughs> and there are many people in government who do want to be transparent, who do want to be accountable to the public. Um, but as you say, they, there are incentives that are uh, matter. Now, Sunlight has historically stood up for something called open government data. The idea that governments, wherever possible, should publish what they know that can be published proactively. Um, one of the things people don't realize is that people use our transparency laws to get business intelligence from government, from the regulatory agencies. A huge amount of the FOIA requests that some of these agencies receive is from business. And all that should be going out proactively, for free. Um, but the transparency that um, journalists often want, that watchdogs often want, isn't necessarily the one that builds trust, right? These are the things that governments don't want to disclose. The transparency that builds trust is governments showing that they did something wrong, but then also showing what they're doing to correct it. One of the best conversations I've had was by the commissioner of the New Orleans Police Department. They're putting data online in real time about some of their issues, and they're doing it because they know that they've had big problems. There's a reason they're under a consent decree with the Justice Department. That was the Justice Department's Office of Information Policy. And to give them a shout, there's a new website called FOIA.gov, which was, um, well, required by Congress um, in 2016 that has statistics on how this is going. And OIP actually asks agencies to put this uh, data up quarterly. But to come back to the transparency side, governments don't want to do it a lot of the time, but a lot of the people who enter government want to. One of them sitting behind you, Corey Zarek, she worked in open government at the Obama White House. Boy, what a difference an administration makes. There's actually a really good, sorry. Yeah. There's a really good example of this, the Trump administration. So previously, all other administrations used to post what uh, the, p the people who were in the cabinet, um, what were their prior you know, economic, um, uh, their, their, yeah, what they owned and what they had investments in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it used to be like published freely. And the Trump administration actually took that down and said, instead, why don't you request it from us, right? So they put it into the FOIA model instead of just publicly posting it. So I think another benefit of proactively posting is it kind of signals like a warrant canary type of situation, right? Mm -hmm. It will, if you, if all of a sudden these documents that previously you would publish start getting taken down or don't get reported might start you know, raising an eyebrow towards that. So I think that's also another added benefit towards we, that. We also typically pitch it in terms of social impact, positive outcomes from releasing these, economic impact, um, accountability impact. Um, it's the right thing to do. Um, it can have impacts upon markets in terms of price transparency. There's a whole host of benefits that come from proactive disclosure. I'm happy to talk more about what we've seen there. Uh, let me grab another question. I have the mic. <laughs> so one thing about the disclosure, um, I, I, as a journalist, I always worried about what I wasn't seeing that I didn't think about. That's, that's one thing. But my question, and my name is Angela Woodall. I'm a PhD candidate at Columbia and also a Tau um, researcher working on the news archiving project. So this is part of a larger, as, as uh, Emily mentioned, is a larger project. So feel free to come and, and talk to us. But my question is, about um, automated processes and information being taken off of platforms um, erroneously. So that might be violent videos, for example, on YouTube um, that has increased according to the numbers that I've seen since the machine learning, so since the automated processes were flagging them. And I just wanted to hear from the panelists about how that affects the public record, especially if we think about when we don't see something, we don't necessarily imagine that it exists at all? Mm. I think that's a great question. Um, the, one of the things that I worry about too is, is, that, is that question, what is, it, what is it that we're missing, what we don't see? Um, one of the things that is, is there 
a real challenge really is, is public information that gets put behind a paywall that um, at places like Stanford we might sometimes pay for a subscription or sometimes not, but sometimes we can't even afford it. And if Stanford libraries can't afford a subscription to a, a certain resource, how is it that the public or public libraries are going to be able to get access to that information? So that is definitely a serious problem. I, I can't speak Jeff, to that. Jeff, can I nudge you to talk about <laughs> yeah. that Yeah, absolutely. Well. I'm trying not to interrupt other folks. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's a critical problem. So it's, it's really tough. So I want to start with a little bit about how things work. So none of those policy violating things, there's not algorithms. I think Zuckerberg's talked to Congress a lot this week and he doesn't speak for YouTube. So uh, he, he, he talked about AI being the future of fixing all this. I think it's a piece, right? And the problem is that it has to be humans plus machine learning, otherwise it's a problem. Um, and I think in particular in this case, this is a perfect example, right? Machine learning is great at some things. It's really, really terrible at other types of nuance, right? It's terrible at understanding when soldiers are from a government going out to kill someone, or that's like an honorary police force, or those are rebel fighters, or it's also hard to tell if this is an ISIS recruitment video, or if this is actually Syrian refugees on the ground being killed. So the disambiguation there is incredibly difficult for humans, essentially impossible for, for machine learning. So I think machine learning at YouTube is something that provides us with potential candidates that might be problematic, but humans then make the decisions on what is actually violating policies or not, and we still make mistakes. Uh, but I think it's important to think about it in that approach, because uh, otherwise you do get into trouble. That concerns me a lot, actually, a lot of uh, initiatives with inside Google and YouTube as well thinking about fairness within machine learning is a big topic and a really important one for us, right? Because these split second decisions, and again, at Google scale, at YouTube scale, you think, oh, it's okay, we're like 99.9% .9 accurate. Great, so that means 10 million hours a month of stuff we screw up on, right? Like that, when it comes to a cat video, who cares? When it comes to Syrian refugees, it's a big deal, right? So I think, uh, I don't know, I, I take the point very strongly, I think we do as a company as well, and really need to focus on how to do better. Can I, can I speak to something? Sure. Um, so I come from a production house, right? We do a lot of production. So I see both the news that goes on the air and the outtakes. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you a story that we had from our 10 o'clock news back in the 80s, I believe it was, 70s. Um, we went out and shot a story about um, a professor at Harvard who was an African-American professor who was not being, who was being denied tenure or something or some sort of thing like that. And there was a big protest at Harvard about it. And our news crew went out and filmed the protest and filmed all the speakers and filmed everything and aired the story. Happened. Years later, you know, we're doing a search. We have our outtakes. We've actually posted some of the outtakes online, not only just the news stories, but the outtakes. A wonderful cataloger during the time of the news story cataloged a, a Barack Obama. Graduate student at Harvard speaks out during the, um, the protest. Fox News picked it up. I don't know if you guys remember when the elections were happening, but I think Frontline used a piece of it during, because uh, his mannerisms are very much the same when he's sitting there, you know, talking. Uh, I think uh, Frontline used it in their choice program. Fox picked it up and said, what is it that they're not showing? What is it that they're not showing that Obama actually did? And it's like, well, he was in the outtakes. There was like two seconds of him. That's it. That's really all that it is. There was nothing more. But I guess I say that just to, to think about the news that you get. Somebody made a decision already to put out what they put out. And I, I think the country needs to learn critical thinking again. You know, OK, <laughs> this source is showing me this vision and this perspective of this event. Um, what else was there that was happening? And I think that we've really lost that. I love the way that Vicky just leaned forward. I totally, yeah, I was like, I mean, I, I think that it's, I think that you're trying to draw an analogy between those two circumstances, but I think that they're slightly different, and here's mm -hmm. why. Um, I think when news reporters spend, you know, months, like and they do in our newsroom, over a year on a story, they've made those decisions really thoughtfully as mm -hmm. to what they've taken out or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And what we're concerned about, I think, in, in this other line of questioning is that um, whether it be AI or someone else sort of quickly trying to determine 
what is or isn't hate speech or what is or isn't violent or what isn't is incendiary is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And moreover, if it were in the hands of the government, would amount to censorship. Mm -hmm. But because it's in the hands of a private body, it is not. Um, and one thing, and I, this is a question that I'm like especially interested in, and, and uh, Zuckerberg's testimony in front of Congress was fascinating. And he, I think, believes in AI doing this and is also thinking about having, setting up a committee or a body to determine some of these, these questions. Um, and I do think that there is a problem with hate speech, especially when we are living in a society that's inundated with this amount of material, which I don't think we've ever faced before in our, in our history's lifetime. So I think that there is value to questioning whether there should be filters. If, even if it's something as simple as like a down button, which would like Reddit does and would degrade the value which with certain things would be seen. Um, but some, and this is, goes back to my earlier point which is I just think it's very important that we require, we begin to require perhaps the same amount of accountability um, and transparency that we demand from government from corporations, right? Like why, I mean, and that's obviously a very difficult line to balance, but when you start approaching the realm of a common carrier or of an agency, Potentially, some of your information, you are taking on the task of a public information officer. And maybe as a public information officer, you should be required to disclose, at the very least, the algorithm that is, and this is something that Michael Corey and I have talked about, um, that he, he suggested this and I thought it was totally brilliant, which is to make transparent the algorithm that the company uses at least to make that selection process because those are ethical and moral decisions that are being implemented through a platform. Thank so, you. So there's time for one more question and you're showing urgency. <laughs> I just want to be a physician that adds, oh, I just want to be a physician that adds some concepts here. We in our training, at least we did 40 years ago, we learned how, we're taught how to evaluate information, and we were taught the difference be, between causative and correlative. Every heroin addict drank milk, therefore milk causes heroin addiction. Mm. We were taught the difference between that. We were also taught how to evaluate evidence, and we were given what is good data and what was not good data. And on top of that, we have editors, and all of our major research publications have editors. They look at the data. They say this is good data. This is not good data. This is good conclusion, not good conclusion. And that is all reviewed before it goes out. Now, I don't know how that can happen for an entire population. But I certainly think that it should be happening at Stanford, where they should be getting the same kind of things of understanding what is true and not true. And I'm. I know I'm a little off topic, but I think it's critical. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that you're, you're really spot on in terms of the way we think about some of the data collection that we're bringing in. So we were asking our, ourselves those questions about whether or not um, we had enough information about the data that people could reuse it and, in a way that wouldn't distort the data. So we, in, in, those kinds of, in those kinds of realms, that's those are things that we're asking ourselves and trying to uh, make sure that the readme file and the code books are explanatory enough, but also having a way that when users go to download that data so that they understand what they're agreeing to do with the data as well, so that they're not just taking it out there and creating some sort of vacuum without context. I just wanted to quickly respond to something that came up here too. There's no question that public records about people can follow them for the rest of their lives and that the decisions platforms make have a huge bearing upon that. If you just look at mugshots in Google, it's a perfect example. Clearly public records, clearly of public interest, but by um, creating some friction, you can change whether they're the first result in Google. Now, Europe has decided there should be a right to be forgotten. Clearly this is a huge risk for some aspects of the public record. But at the same time, we can also think of examples where someone's history as, say, a juvenile maybe shouldn't follow them around. 
Um, these are really difficult questions. Now, you can put it a high level principle. Publicity should be proportionate to power, right? Our expectations of mandatory disclosure for the president is taxes are different than those of a private citizen, right? We want someone to be private by default, we want something to be open by default. But the platforms now can make people public in ways they never could before, algorithmically, for instance, if they belong to different groups. And as such, they then have, I think, a different responsibility than they used to before. And one of the ways you get to this, this question of transparency, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get Google to crack open its search algorithm, but we definitely can say the FTC should have technologists who should get to audit it. Oh. We can't necessarily say to Facebook, you gotta show up to your news feed. But we can say state legislators can work together with regulators to see whether there is algorithmic discrimination in what people are being shown. Like, that kind of transparency may be appropriate, and it might be appropriate to start talking about where and when those models okay. get pushed out there. I just wanted to make I sure I got one, it. One of the things, since it's been lots of people talking about platforms, mm -hmm. uh, and I happen to be from one of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you're here to help. And I'm here, yeah, I'm here to help, hopefully. So I'll stick around to talk to folks afterwards, too. Um, I, I think another piece of that, I think that's fair. And I think in the EU, you're going to see stuff like that actually happen, yeah. right? You know, it's the GDPR this year, but there's e-privacy coming next year. There's a whole round of new regulations uh, coming out. I think the other thing is, is transparency at a principal level. Like we might not, we're not gonna produce 150 million lines of code for people to analyze, right? But what we could do is in fact say, you know, here's the 20 principles that we abide by in our search algorithm, make that public and say, we hold ourselves accountable to these principles, which we make public, right? So that's also like an in-between. Like instead of here's how everything works, which you actually don't want the detail of, here's the principles that we abide by and we're held accountable to. And the second we put it out there, we're held accountable to it by the FTC in the United States and various other bodies around the world. So I think it's a really interesting step that we could take that makes us accountable and also gives the level of insight that people actually want to know about what we do. I think that's fair, and I think journalists also similarly have codes of ethics, right? And they, they do have, and I think that that step is certainly one that I think would heighten public trust in mm -hmm. those institutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's fascinating. We're out of time, um, but I think that at this point we should uh, give this amazing panel a round of applause. <laughs> and, and I think the conversation is going to uh, continue. Yes. Oh yeah. Wow, well, what a super afternoon. Um, I'm Ann Grimes, I co-direct the Brown Institute for Media Innovation here at Stanford. And um, it is clear from our conversation today that the challenges and opportunities of preserving news and news archives are considerable, whether it is making the Wayback Machine um, work more effectively, uh, whether it is enlarging the footprint of the Wikimedia Foundation, whether it is um, identifying credible news sources, uh, figuring out problems with verification, outing fake news, preserving tapes and other records, finding funding to preserve those tapes, um, figuring out why some content makes it and others, like buttered cows, does not. Um, defining what a public record is and uh, figuring out whose responsibility it is to preserve those records. These are big questions and there are no an easy answers, but we want to thank you all for helping us jumpstart this conversation, this important conversation. So um, let me close by thanking all of you for coming, especially those of you who came from out of town. Um, a, another round of applause to for all of our panelists who were fabulous. Really, so, so, so good. Um, thanks to our sister organization, the Tau Center at Columbia, uh, and a special shout out to uh, my colleague Emily Bell and uh, Mirachel Roca for um, prompting us to host this. Thank you. This is really just terrific. Uh, as along with uh, our uh, her team, uh, their team uh, from Tau, Kathy, Pre, Angela, Sharon, Katie, and George. I think I got everybody. Uh, special thanks to my uh, Brown program manager, Kelly Yilmaz, for helping set everything up, and as well as uh, to my colleague, um, Manish Agarwala, and to uh, Francesco Fiandella. Thank you for sharing your insights onto your Brown project. We're really proud of you. Uh, 
Um, let me close by inviting all of you to sign up for our Brown mailing list. We would like to keep you informed of our upcoming events. Uh, our next event will be in May, on May 15th, when we are going to be hosting another New Yorker um, from uh, NYU. Jay Rosen will be come out, coming out to talk to us and continuing our conversations about trust and transparency. So we hope you can join us for that. And again, thanks so much for uh, joining us today.